next program for Special Bulletin. Here now is Sandy Hill. Seismologists at Caltech now report at least three separate seismic events tonight, each in the northern hemisphere with earth tremors of magnitude 8.5 and above. Now, the first location is believed to be in the Thunder Basin area of Wyoming. That's about 200 miles east of Casper. So far, we have no reports of casualties. The other two sites in Europe and Asia have not been identified. But stay tuned at 11 o'clock news for further details. We now resume our regularly scheduled program. Meteor shower, which appears at this time every year, erupted into a massive cosmic event tonight as pieces of an enormous asteroid plunged to Earth. Reports are just coming in, but it appears that at 8.24 p.m. Eastern Time, the near-Earth asteroid known as 6645 Venturi hurtled from space and broke apart, striking the Earth at three separate points around the globe. Aftershocks were felt, from Kamchatka Island in the Aleutians to Santiago, Chile. In all three cases, the meteorites hit deserted rural areas, leaving wide impact zones. Scientists say if any one of them had struck near an urban center, the results would have been catastrophic. We begin our coverage with correspondent Pamela Barnes outside Mount Palomar Observatory in the mountains east of San Diego. Sandy, as this story first broke, the report suggested that three massive earthquakes struck worldwide. The initial shock waves registered within minutes of each other at Caltech. The best image we have right now is this infrared shot from a KH-11 reconnaissance satellite. The crater is 2.4 kilometers wide, more than a mile and a half across. The red you see around the rim is a section of scorched earth from a wildfire that set the grasslands ablaze at the moment of impact. Correspondent Bree Walker was vacationing in Wyoming when the meteor hit. She came in with the first fire crews and we go to her above the crater. I'm told we're having trouble with the feed from Wyoming, so we'll bring Bree Walker's report to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, we go to Barry Steinbrenner of affiliate KTML in Casper, Wyoming. With fires from the meteor crater raging out of control, units from the 3rd Air National Guard Wing were quickly called in to extinguish the flames. More than 10,000 people living west of Thunder Basin are being evacuated by National Guardsmen amid fears the fires may spread. And there are numerous reports of power outages both north and east of Cheyenne. This is Barry Steinbrenner, KTML Action News. The following message is being transmitted by order of the Wyoming National Guard. A meteor explosion has been reported. Please stay indoors and keep all windows and doors locked until this situation has ended. The emergency broadcast system has been activated. From the chopper's camera mounted below. What you're looking at now is, is the crater itself. A massive inferno is the only way you could describe this. In fact, one of the firefighters I talked to said temperatures were near 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit and above. Any human being within miles of this impact would have been incinerated in seconds. As we came in through the smoke and the haze along the crater's east rim, the scene of devastation below was unbelievable, with dozens of state troopers and National Guardsmen surrounding the impact site. When the asteroid hit, it touched off a massive firestorm that destroyed much of Thunder Basin. We're told that chopper you see down below is flying a team of hazardous material specialists from the Department of Energy. We expect that they'll be checking for a, a radiation or any potentially deadly chemicals that might still be off-gassing from the site. And Sandy? Sandy, we're just getting word that there may have been some survivors along the Thunder Basin National Grasslands. We're going to go over there now for a look. The two other pieces of this gigantic meteorite came down first in the Gobi Desert of China along the southern edge of Mongolia. And minutes later in a mountainous area of the Pyrenees, about 20 miles south of Lourdes in southern France. 
Now tentatively known as Impact Site Bravo, Lourdes was the site in 1858 of a fabled visitation by the Virgin Mary. It's been a mecca for religious pilgrims ever since. But tonight, as correspondent Paul Whitaker reports, the mood there is one of fear. The churches are full here tonight with religious pilgrims giving thanks. But not because they came to this holy site, because they're alive. Only hours before the asteroid fell in the mountains to the south, hundreds of people were still on the snow-capped peaks after a long day of recreation and skiing. On était dans le dernier téléphérique de la journée. He was in the last Avec tous les cable amis. car off the mountain. Et puis tout coup, tout, tout Just as the earth comme started ça. to shake, Et puis, uh, le ciel he and his friends looked, looked up to the sky feu, uh, and saw a huge Et puis, fireball uh, streaking dit, across uh, the sky. This woman, Sylvie Chenard, also survived. But when she got down, she discovered her husband, Jean-Paul, was missing. Il, euh, il était le dernier à descendre la pente. Il, il voulait skier encore. Une... Um, I, uh, he, I, I took down the cable car and uh, Jean said he... Uh... All residents of Northeast Wyoming return to your homes immediately. The following message is being transmitted by order of the Wyoming Department of Emergency Management and FEMA. Reports claim that another two asteroids collided with trajectories in Europe and Asia. At this time this is unknown how this happened but everyone is to lock all doors and windows and to stay indoors for the rest of the night. The emergency broadcast system has been activated. But tonight, as the lucky ones celebrate, happy to be alive, one senses these people will never be quite the same again. Paul Whitaker reporting from Lourdes, France. Little is known tonight about the third impact site in China. But as correspondent Denise Wong reports in Beijing, the communist government has put the country on a state of alert. Sandy, it's just after 10.15 in the morning here in Beijing. Sin Xinhua, the Chinese news agency, has reported that the third asteroid hit at 9.29 a.m. Beijing time. It struck at 105 degrees east, 45 degrees north along China's border with Mongolia. While little more has come from the government here, Reuters has just released this aerial photo taken by the French satellite agency SPOT from 12 miles above the Earth. Uh, the crater is almost a mile and a half across. Denise, that's almost identical, I repeat, identical to the Wyoming impact site. What do you know about casualties? Well, Sandy, uh, Tian Song is in a remote area of the Gobi Desert with no rail lines and few highways in or out. As a result, it may be days before the full damage from this third impact site can be assessed. We'll be back to you, Denise, as soon as there's more. I thank you. We switch now to the Johnson Space Center, where Matt Jensen is standing by. Sandy, the NASA scientists who track these enormous asteroids sometimes refer to them as killer rocks. As such, one of the first questions we asked was how. How could an asteroid of this magnitude have come so close to Earth and not be detected till impact? In July, the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 struck the planet Jupiter in a series of massive impacts equal in force to two million hydrogen bombs. These events were monitored worldwide through the enormous eye of the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting the Earth. Scientists had known for months that these events on Jupiter were about to take place. In fact, they were actually able to... Later, the Air Force called it a weather balloon, but a secret government report made public years later described the recovery of four tiny bodies from the Roswell crash site. And ever since then, there have been hundreds of reported sightings. However, the Air Force shut down Project Blue Book, concluding, quote, no evidence has been found that any of the UFO reports reflect a threat to our national security. Well, there's science fact and there's science fiction. To help separate the two, we go now to a man who spent years studying the threat from these massive meteors. Arthur C. Clarke, the noted author of 2001 and dozens of other books, 
was recently nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He joins us now live from his home in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Dr. Clark, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Dr. Clark, as far back as 1973, in your book, Rendezvous with Rama, you wrote about the threat from near-Earth asteroids. Isn't that right? That's correct. There are those who believe tonight's impacts may have some connection to extraterrestrials. What's your view? Well, I believe there's plenty of intelligent life out there in space, but actual visitors, very unlikely, despite the claims of the UFO enthusiasts. Why is that? Well, we've been sending out radio, radar signals for 50 years. They now fill a volume of space 100 light years across, but we haven't had any reply. Well, UFO advocates would say that you have had replies, but that the government just isn't telling. And nonsense. I'd give any saucer gate about 24 hours to unravel. And apart from the broadcast transmissions, NASA has made attempts to send messages to any possible civilization in space using the Voyager space probes. I understand you have a copy there of the disk they sent out on Voyager 2. Yes, a record like this, carrying pictures and messages from the peoples of Earth and from the United Nations. Well, if they're out there and we sent them a beacon, so to speak, why wouldn't they answer? I'm afraid it's a function of time and space. The distance between advanced civilizations may be thousands of light years, so even if they were traveling at the speed of light, it might take them several millennia to get here. But just for the sake of argument, say it was possible. All right, then the question is why bother to come here? For the Earth to be chosen, we must assume we're rather special. But looking at the primitive state of our civilization, I think that's very conceited. So what are you saying? Well, there's a much bigger issue at stake. The need to protect ourselves against rogue asteroids, which are very real and pose a much bigger threat to Earth. Thank you, Dr. Clark. That was scientist and author Arthur C. Clark speaking to us from Sri Lanka. We go to Lourdes, France, where correspondent Paul Whitaker has an update on the condition of Jean-Paul Junard, the French skier who survived the second impact. I'm here at Julian Airport near Lourdes, France, where just moments ago doctors airlifted Jean-Paul Chouinard to the Colombert Burn Center in Nice. We spoke to Chouinard's wife, Sylvie, just moments Madame before Chouinard. they departed. No, pas maintenant. What is your husband's condition, please? Uh, um, he, uh, he was trying to tell me, uh, I don't know, maybe how he's... We interrupt our programming. This is a national emergency. The following message is being transmitted by order of the White House and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. All broadcast and cable stations shall transmit this broadcasted message. There has been unconfirmed reports that the recent events that happened earlier today was caused by extraterrestrial life forms but this has not been confirmed by any verifiable source. We now have news that President Bill Clinton is making emergency travel back to Washington from his visit to the United Kingdom. The United States Secretary will be speaking on all channels shortly. Please stand by for this message. Uh, earlier tonight, uh, following the impact of three meteor fragments, President Clinton directed NASA to begin around-the-clock monitoring of all near-Earth asteroids with the potential of penetrating the atmosphere. At approximately 9.17 p.m., the Air Force's geodes tracking stations at Socorro, New Mexico, Maui, Hawaii, and Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean uh, detected the presence of what appears to be a second asteroid. At 65 meters or 200 feet in length, it is on a trajectory almost identical to the path of 6645 Venturi. The radio telescope at Arecibo, Puerto Rico locked on and they confirm that the object is heading toward the Earth at an airspeed of 32,000 miles per hour. The expected impact in the area of the polar ice cap is some five minutes from now. At 9.52 p.m. Eastern Time, the President and Joint Chiefs of Staff ordered units of the 388th Fighter Wing from Hill Air Force Base to U in Utah to a full alert. 
a pair of F-16 fighters from the 18th Space Surveillance Squadron were ordered into the air on a defense condition two status. The planes are armed with Hawk optically guided missiles capable of destroying the asteroid before impact. Uh, these missiles are tipped with two kiloton low yield nuclear warheads. The, uh, the F-16s are expected to be in target range at approximately 1016 is four minutes from now. Barbara, Barbara, um, Barbara, yes, Barbara. Um, Mario, yes. Barbara, how can the president possibly justify the use of nuclear weapons? Uh, well, a panel from the National Academy of Sciences met tonight, and their conclusion was that if the asteroid penetrated the ice cap, then the consequences to the Earth's ecological balance could be absolutely catastrophic. What about the radio signals jamming air traffic? How will that affect the F-16's launch? Uh, it is our understanding that the traffic is affected only along the 45th parallel? Yes. 45th parallel. Yes, Michelle. Did the president consult Congress? Uh, the president did speak with leaders of both houses earlier this evening. Yes. And what about other world leaders? Uh, Russian President Boris Yeltsin and Chinese Premier Deng Xiaoping have been informed, both leaders have expressed their consent, as has the chairman of the UN Security Council. Let me just wait, let me just tell you one other thing, and that is that the missile hardware uh, that is to be used is identical to that which was deployed so successfully in the Gulf War. That's all that we have. To You are listening to the emergency broadcast system. All normal programming has now been suspended due to a national threat level event. President Bill Clinton will address the nation in approximately three hours. We are World New 24 and we will continue to serve the Washington, D.C. area. If you are not in this local area, please tune to another station providing news and information for your local area. The United States Air Force Chief of Staff will speak on this event on all channels in one minute. You are listening to the emergency broadcast system. All broadcast and satellite systems shall transmit this message. Please stand by for an official message from the U.S. Office of Defense and Mitigation. Unable to connect. Now. Transferring to U.S. Department of Defense and Mitigation. ...is from a camera uh, mounted in the cockpit of Interceptor 1. T-minus 30 seconds. That's Major Scotty Powers, the Air Force Launch Control Officer. Enable warheads. Warhead enabled. Confirm. Locked on guidance. Roger. Radar lock. Two's locked. Prepare to fire, then egress left. Clear to fire in three, two, one. Engage. Come on home, boys. Ten Roger, seconds to contact. Eight, seven. What the hell was that? Six. I too, Johnny. Five. Negative. We're losing video on India One. Rookie India Two. Do you copy? We have contact. <laughs> It seems India like we had a direct India hit on the asteroid, India but there's, two, there's some what concern here six. that we've lost the image of the cockpit. You copy. Say again. Okay, now we've lost the image of both India 1 and India 2. Dale. India 1, India Dale. 2. Dale. What happened to the image here on the, uh, in the cockpit? I have no comment. I don't know. We saw it. Was it a hit on the asteroid? Do we have any information? I have no comment. Come in. What happened to the pilots? People are watching here. John, Maui, come in. India 1, India 2. Dale, you have to let us know. Did we lose pilots on this or not? With a pilot shot down.
At 10.16 p.m., some four seconds before the asteroid was destroyed, the transponder signals from the two F-16s went on, off boys. the radar Come screens. On. At the same time, the sounds we've been hearing from the craters were heard in the F-16's transmission. The two pilots, Air Force Captain Charles Reichheiser, 32, and Major John Pastorelli, 36, both of Hill Air Force Base, are missing and presumed dead. The nuclear submarine, USS Houston, which surfaced at the polar ice cap, has reported seeing debris consistent with the afterburner of an F-16. Search teams are racing to the scene from Gander, Newfoundland. Now to the Pentagon, where the... We interrupt that broadcast for a message from the U.S. Military and Air Force Command Center, F-16-1325 has lost contact with Earth, this is believed to be an effect of the nuclear warheads hitting the asteroid as mentioned by the briefing, the Pentagon will be speaking on all channels shortly about this situation, we are World News 24 and we will continue to serve the Washington D.C. area until further notice. Please stand by for a broadcast from the Pentagon. Air Force is about to conduct a briefing on what they're calling defensive engagement with the meteor. The postmortem will be handled by Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Norbert Hazelton and General Lucian Alexander, U.S. Air Force Ladies Chief of Staff. Let me say at the outset that we are deeply grieved over the loss of two outstanding Air Force pilots. But they gave their lives so that we can stand here tonight and report a near-perfect mission profile. I want to stress that the warhead loads were extremely low yield. Any trace radiation should dissipate in the atmosphere within a matter of days. All radio signals from Wyoming, France, and Mongolia have ceased once again. There is every reason to believe that what the people of the Earth experienced was a natural phenomenon. General Alexander, General, General Alexander, how, how can you attribute this to natural phenomenon when we all saw the glow inside the cockpit? Just a lens flare. At air speeds like that, with the light conditions over the pole, the cockpit array throws off a number of video spikes. Okay, but wait, wait what, what about the trajectory? All right, come on. 6645 Venturi and the same asteroid, the latest one, they were on the identical path. Not surprising. It's not surprising. It's quite possible they were both part of the same source asteroid. No, no. The pieces simply split in deep space and came in online. I'll tell you one thing, ladies and gentlemen. If there was ever an argument for jump-starting the anti-missile defense shield, this is it. We were lucky tonight. Good shooting, great hardware. The next time, it might be a different story. Next time, Jerry? What do you suggest? There's going to be a next time? That anti-missile shield the general was talking about, of course, is the Star Wars system, a favorite of President Reagan's.
put on the shelf when President Clinton came into power. Sandy, the Air Force F-16 jet carrying Dr. Avram Mandel has touched down in Houston. Uh, he's about to arrive at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and Matt Jensen is there live. Matthew? Yeah, Carolyn, any minute now, that door behind me will open, and a man who has been something of an enigma in all this will arrive and speak with me. Wait, there he is. Any comment on the action over the pole? Tell us something. They do have a comment. The action. Carolyn, any minute now, that door behind me will open, and a man who has been something of an enigma in all this will arrive and speak with me. There he is. Any comment on the action over the pole? Tell us something. They do have a comment. The action of the Pentagon is frankly unforgivable. There is a force behind these asteroids that is clearly intelligent. The fact that they chose to land first in unpopulated areas demonstrates clearly that they meant us no harm. The, the radio signal was acting merely as a sort of transponder to help steer the second vehicle in. But the second vehicle is... Like crashing down to Earth. Listen to me, people. The, the entire notion of a flying saucer is a fiction. It's a fiction. They took the form that they wanted to take. They came in the way that they chose to come, in peace at first. Well, what are you saying, Doctor? What I'm saying is that we have made a preemptive strike, people. We have just declared war. It's clear that Dr. Mandel is quite emotional. And as soon as we have details of his meeting here, we'll be back. This is Matt Jensen, Evening World News at the Johnson Space Center. An Evening World News telephone poll suggests that more than two-thirds of the public now believes that the asteroids are connected to alien life forms. It has been a night filled with charges and countercharges, but we would be remiss as journalists if we didn't separate fact from allegation. To the best of anyone's knowledge, at this point, the giant meteors that came to Earth tonight were of natural origin. All right. Um, with the radio signals now silent, Robert Marino is live from Faith, a Wyoming town less than 50 miles from the impact site Alpha. Robert. I'm here in Faith, an old religious community dating back to the mid-19th century. The town is well outside the evacuation zone. There were no reported casualties or incidents after the nearby impact. Then, after the meteor explosion at the North Pole, Wyoming Edison detected an unusual power surge here. They sent a repair crew out to inspect, and when they got here, this is what they found. Sandy, the streets are deserted. Everybody has vanished. Men, women, children, cats and dogs. I mean, cars are left in the middle of the streets, and except for the National Guardsmen, there isn't a soul here. The town is completely empty, frozen in time. The sidewalks are strewn with trick-or-treat bags, as if the children had simply dropped them as they left. I, I don't know what else to say. It's eerie. Air National Guard Sergeant Leroy Diggs told us he was a forward recon in Desert Storm, but that he never saw anything like this. It's like they got swallowed up. We did a full house-to-house, -house, checked for radiation, toxic emissions. We got nothing. I'm telling you, there's no way to explain this. The rescue workers are even using motion detectors set to pick up the smallest movement, but there's nothing. In a town where 3,000 people live, work, and go to school, Everyone is simply gone. As soon as we have any word on what happened here, we'll be back. But for now, this is a ghost town. This is Robert Marino, Faith, Wyoming. A rather sad note from France. Paul Whitaker reports from outside the Colombier Burn Center in Nice, where it's now morning. It's 6.43 a.m. Greenwich time here, Sandy, and doctors have just sent word that Jean-Paul Chouinard, the French skier they plucked off the mountain, has died. He regained consciousness briefly before succumbing to injuries sustained when the asteroid hit, and doctors were able to get a recording of his last words here. Fearing that it would be exploited by the tabloid press, his widow Sylvie has requested that it be released to the networks. Evening World News continuing coverage will resume in a moment.
continuing our coverage in the aftermath of three enormous meteor fragments that struck the Earth tonight, we go first to correspondent Mike Curtis at the FAA's Air Traffic System Command in Washington, D.C. Radio signals from the three impact sites may have stopped, but aviation authorities report ticket counters jammed at airports nationwide. This is Baltimore Washington International. Most airlines report delays of up to three hours as dozens of flights are being diverted there. Sandy, this is a continental light market and fortunately the people at this end of the terminal are able to get out because these flights are still taking off. Authorities say it may be morning before traffic returns to normal. This is Mike Curtis at the Aviation Command Center, Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, correspondent Warren Olney has news on the final words of French skier Jean-Paul Chouinard. He's outside NASA's Goldstone facility in the Mojave Desert. Warren? Carolyn, in this breaking story that seems to take a different turn every minute, we have just learned that the last words of Jean-Paul Chouinard are being analyzed here by NASA's computers. They're checking for any similarities between Chouinard's incomprehensible speech pattern and that of eight-year-old Kimberly Hastings, who, of course, was found more than 6,000 miles away. We'll have more on this when we get it. Now back to you. We have an update now on little Kimberly Hastings, the eight-year-old girl found wandering near impact site Alpha. Bree Walker is at Mercy Medical Center in Casper, Wyoming. Bree? Finally, some good news to report as little Kimberly's condition is upgraded from critical to stable. Doctors are still not able to get through to her verbally, so there's no way to know what, if anything, she remembers from the asteroid crash. As to how she got to the impact site, when Donna Hastings, her mother, arrived at the hospital just moments ago, she was mobbed by media, wanting to know the answer to that question. How did Kimberly get to Wyoming? Daddy, I got a court order. Keep him away, but he didn't care about it. Come on, fellas, give us a break. Tell us more. Tell us more. Tell us more. Three days ago, he went off to daycare and he just up and he took her from me. But why so far from home? Come on, we're in here. He said that he was going to go to Canada. So you're the lady from the network, right? You're the one who found Kimber? What's your name? What's your name? So much. She, she's so pissed me to see you. Donna. Sandy, Dr. Robert Perlman, the astronomer we interviewed earlier, has done a computer analysis of the first three impact sites. He's joining us now live from his lab at the American Observatory in Kitt Peak, Arizona. Dr. Perlman, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. This is a 3D model of 6645 Venturi as it came to Earth. It breaks up at a point some 6,500 miles above 90 degrees north latitude, which is the true North Pole. You can see the three fragments falling to their impact sites, designated Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. As I connect the trajectories, you will see what looks like a diamond-shaped pyramid with its apex above the pole. The angles on impact are exactly 45 degrees. Uh, forgive me, Dr. Perlman, but that looks remarkably like the line drawing you showed us earlier. What's so new about this model? Well, it will become relevant when I show you this. Now, this is an exact reproduction of a pixelated message that was sent out in 1973 on Pioneer 11. Here you will see symbols for man, the solar system, the DNA double helix, which is the basic molecule of life, and a figure representing the Pioneer spacecraft itself. You will note the upside down pyramid. Now watch. It's unmistakable. The asteroid fragments represented a symbol they were using the descent vectors to send us a message. That's an intriguing theory, Dr. Perlman, but I'm sure you'll agree it's subject to debate. Of course. We've invited Dr. Norbert Hazleton to join us. He's Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, and if you don't mind, he has some questions. Not at all. Fire away, Dr. Hazleton. Dr. Perlman, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that aliens visited Earth tonight? Uh, no, no, I said it was possible. Come, come. You brought in Pioneer. You've uh, matched a couple of triangles. What are you saying? Well, if you put it like that point blank, yes, it sounds improbable. But consider what happened tonight. The pattern of the impact sites, the radio signals, survivors speaking in tongues, an entire town missing. 
Forgive me, Doctor. This isn't some Trekkie convention. There are millions of people in the world right now panicking needlessly. Yes, and I would like to know how much that has to do with the hair trigger response Don't of the Pentagon. Me, Doctor. If you can show me aliens in those triangles, I'll give you the second gunman on the grassy knoll. Listen, you know as well as I do that the scientific community is divided on this, but you people, you people see this as an opportunity to hotwire Star Wars, and it shouldn't come down to that. There is much more at stake here. You're damn right there is. Gentlemen, I'm sorry, but we've run out of time. You've just heard from astronomer Robert Perlman and Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Norbert Hazelton. And now to recap, the Earth was rocked tonight by three separate fragments from an enormous meteor that landed in the United States, Europe, and Asia. A second meteor on a direct path with the first one was shot down by U.S. planes using nuclear weapons over the North Pole. The two pilots in that mission perished. After radio signals from the three meteor fragments began jamming air traffic worldwide, civil unrest broke out in a number of countries, with some speculating that the asteroids may have a connection to extraterrestrials. That issue has fractured the scientific community. While the sole survivor of the asteroid impact in Wyoming, an eight-year-old girl remains hospitalized, unable to speak. President Clinton is now jetting back to Washington aboard Air Force One. He scheduled an address to the nation when he lands at Andrews Air Force Base at 11.16 p.m. Eastern Time. Forgive me, Sandy, but Dr. Avram Mandel, the SETI scientist rushed to the Johnson Space Center, has just emerged from a meeting with NASA officials. He's talking with reporters right now, and we pick up his comments in progress. No, 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 I'm, I'm way past that. But well, why do this here? Because I'm no longer speaking as a staff scientist at NASA. Effective at 9.32 p.m. Central Time, I have resigned my position. As a concerned astronomer, and most importantly, as a human being, I can no longer associate myself with the government's handling of this ongoing crisis. Look, look. We were given a gift tonight, people. We had a visitation. They came in peace, and we answered them with 2,000 tons of TNT at the end of a nuclear warhead. Now, what if this had been Jesus, or, or Buddha, or Mohammed, or, or a prophet of old? I mean, haven't we learned anything from history? I mean, we all know that we have the most violent planet in the galaxy, but why? In God's name, why did we have to take it to them? Look, Doctor, you're upset. Why don't we, why don't we do this the right no, way? No, I, I wanted to do this the right way, Dale. That's why I flew out here. I tried to plead with these people, and it didn't do any good. Dr. Mandel, you mentioned before that this is an ongoing crisis. What did you mean by that? You don't know? No. You mean they haven't told you anything? Look, the they doctor is clearly disturbed. Dale, Dale, Bobby, Dale, don't you do you this. Done? This is not responsible. Dale, I am responsible to myself now. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. At approximately 10.32 p.m. Eastern Time, the radio telescope hit, um, at Goldstone Mojave, received a signal. Air Force tracking stations locked on as well. There are three asteroids of a magnitude of two miles each and above that are on a trajectory with Earth. They are headed directly toward three of the Earth's most populous cities, Beijing in the People's Republic of China, Moscow, as well as Washington, D.C. Why those cities, Doctor? I don't know. I can only guess, and that is that they are the capitals of the only three nations on this planet who have a first-strike nuclear threat. The, um, the asteroids are expected to hit sometime around 10.52 p.m. Eastern Time. That's, that's nine minutes from now. We declared war against them, people. We did it. And now they've just decided to respond. So may God have mercy on us all. Our coverage of this continuing crisis will resume after this. From now on, we'll stay on the air continuously until this crisis is over. As we count down now to the moment of impact, the mayors of the nation's 10 largest cities have all imposed curfews. 
Looting is widespread amid fears of food shortages as the crisis deepens. Meanwhile, the radio signals at all three impact sites have resumed. This time they're affecting not only commercial air traffic, but radio and TV signals across the globe. In many countries, telephone service is out. The reaction in this country has been panic. Hopefully everything's going to be okay, but I just don't know what I'm going to do when it happens. Well, as of, as of right now, I'm not really frightened because, I mean, I, really, I, I haven't seen them. And, I mean, they haven't really come after me, but if they start coming after me, yeah, I'm going to be scared. I gotta get out of here. My family's waiting for me. Now I've been there like They fight here. I'm not a religious person. I have We interrupt. This is a national threat level emergency. The following message is being transmitted by order of FEMA and the White House and the United States government. All commercial radio and TV signals, please tune to EBS now. Stand down. Tune to EBS now. Stand down. I repeat. Stand down. To prevent mass chaos and looting all programming will be replaced with the emergency broadcast system, and all updates will come from this medium. We are World News 24 and we will continue to serve the Washington DC area. NASA has just confirmed target number two locations impacted include Washington DC United States, Moscow United Socialist Soviet Republic and Beijing China, on order of 42nd President William Jefferson Clinton, three interceptor missiles is going to be launched at the targets to prevent damage to the United States or its allies. Bill Clinton has just landed at Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport. From now on we will continue to broadcast until this is over. The expected time of impact is 5 minutes. Take shelter now. Take evasive action to protect life and property now. I repeat do not look at the light in the sky. Brace. Brace. Brace now. Brace. Brace. Brace now. To brace put your head in your knees and duck and cover under a sturdy furniture or interior room. If no such shelter, lay flat on a ditch and cover your face and ears. Please keep in mind that all radio and TV outlets may be impacted if the interceptors fail. In case of that happening, firing interceptors, target one of three has been successfully intercepted. Moscow Russia now responded. Launch in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, fire, target two of three fired. Signal lost now transmitting to other news source. It's, it's getting too close, Sandy. Why aren't they shooting at this thing now? Three, two, one. Thank God. Thank God. How does it feel out there? It feels Fa fabulous. <laughs> it's like the day the wall went down. Yeah. Happy birthday, Paul. Happy birthday, Paul. Uh -oh. Thank you, Sandy. Sandy. Thank you, Denise. We're going to go home now. I'd say you've earned it. Thanks for a job well done. Thank you very much. Have a very Thank good you. day. Have a good day. Reaction from around the world is typical of this live footage you're seeing right now. Well, before we sign off, correspondent Warren Olney has some information for us from Goldstone. Sandy, the scientists here have deciphered the speech patterns of Kimberly Hastings and John Paul Schunar. Here's the feed now. Has that Hundred and forty seven member states. Wait a minute. That's the recorded message we sent up in Voyager two. 
Sandy, there's a report from the Johnson Space Center. Matt Jensen is there with a... Uh, comes to us live. Matt? Carolyn, as you can see, the elation in the room behind me has stopped. People were cheering and celebrating, and then it was as if a balloon would burst. A quiet permeated the room, and nobody seems to be giving any indication why. Matt, what is it? Matt, what do you see? Just tell, tell us what you're seeing, Matt. The cam what's, the, what, what, what's the cameraman's name? I'm told his name is Patrick. Patrick, Patrick, just move the camera to the screen. Show us what you're seeing on the screen. Patrick, do you read the... Open show us what's on the... Track trajectories. No, there's too many. There's too many to calculate. Now, oh, my God. Friends, this is Houston. Friends, do you copy? Friends, this is Houston. Come in, please. Do you copy? Mexico City, this is Houston. Mexico City, do you copy? Do you read me? Uh, please change frequencies and copy. Mexico City, Maui. State your incoming. Maui, state your incoming. London, this is Houston. London, do you read me? This is Houston. London, if you're there, please answer. Anchorage reports Juno has been destroyed. Uh, we have Beijing, right. Beijing, we have this no is Houston, Beijing, do you copy? At all. Beijing, Negative please come in. Hitting the Earth's surface if you can hear the sound of my voice, please, please come in. Please stand by for the last playing of our national anthem and the UK national anthem.